good day, everybody. My name is Ross Dixon. I'm a research consultant with ACENET, and I'm going to be talking today about what ACENET users should know about uh, the new clusters that ACENET and Compute Canada have brought online in the last few months. Uh, I'm just going to vamp for another minute or so here, so people who are trying to tune in right on the dot of 12 o'clock will find us, have a chance to find us before we get too far in. Um, let me see. Um, with the uh, technology we're using here, video, uh, we're in what's known as presenter mode and the only person who can show pictures and uh, talk right now is me. Um, if you have questions, uh, it would probably be easiest if you uh, note them down and there will be a time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, we'll change modes at that point and let you know when you can uh, either ask your questions verbally or you can uh, send them to us in the, in the chat window at that point. Um, as I say, that will be at uh, at the end of the presentation, um, which should be somewhere about 50 minutes or so from now. Let's see, and dismiss some more distractions here so I don't get too distracted while I'm talking. Um, So the, uh, the motivation for, uh, for today's talk, uh, as I expect you are probably aware, is that uh, ACENET has been running um, four general purpose high performance computing clusters for several years now, uh, getting close to 10 years in some cases. Um, and those four clusters, uh, Fundy, Glooscamp, Mahone, and Placentia, are going to be defunded and uh, sometime around next March 31st will be decommissioned. Um, we'll be handing all the controls back to the universities where the hardware sits and uh, it's reasonable to suppose that most of them will cease operation very soon thereafter. Um, but the good news is that there is new hardware available for you to do uh, high performance computing on. Um, it just happens to not be installed inside ACENET territory. It's installed in uh, Ontario and uh, British Columbia right now with more coming. Um, and so consequently, this talk um, could have been given this uh, opening slide or it could have been given this opening slide with Compute Canada the colors on it. Um, ACENET, me and uh, my colleague Chris, who's uh, running the soundboard for me today, and all the other analysts uh, with ACENET are still here to help you get your research computing done. Uh, it's just that uh, we're going to help you get it done on the uh, brand new systems uh, that uh, have just been coming online in the last few months. And uh, you can think of ACENET as your uh, regional gateway to, uh, to Compute Canada resources. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to mostly erase the distinction, distinction between ACENET and Compute Canada for you. Hide the messy bureaucracy that's, uh, that's behind all that stuff. Um, one slide of history to uh, give you a bit of a background of how we got here. Um, about 2014 or 2015, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, CFI, uh, let ACENET and SharpNet and SciNet and WestGrid and Calcul Quebec know that um, in conjunction with uh, funding a major refresh of uh, research computing hardware, that uh, these organizations should consider running fewer data centers. At that point, there were something like 50-some oh, clusters uh, scattered uh, across uh, some 30 or 40 data centers. Um, the expectation that uh, everyone held and still holds is that uh, with fewer data centers holding larger computers, um, we can run things more efficiently, um, both uh, financially and in terms of things like job scheduling and, and power consumption and so on. Uh, so in 2016, 2017, um, Compute Canada has installed three large new national clusters, which are called Arbutus, Cedar, and Graham, uh, along with retiring a lot of those old 40 or 50 systems. 
they're not all gone yet. Retirements are ongoing. The uh, retirement of the ACENET clusters is part of that process. Hasn't happened yet, but it's coming, like I say, uh, early next year. Um, three new systems come up. A fourth system is in procurement right now. It's going to be called Niagara, and it's uh, going to sit uh, near Toronto. Um, and plans are being laid for a fifth new uh, national system as well. Um, these new national clusters uh, that I just named, um, Arbutus, which uh, happens to sit uh, at uh, University of Victoria, um, is largely a cloud resource. It's uh, a collection of hardware meant for running virtual machines. Um, it's, uh, it's fulfilling a number of uh, pretty variable roles. For example, the uh, um, a large Hadron Collider uh, group at CERN in Switzerland and France um, has farmed out its uh, its uh, computing uh, problems to other physics groups all over the planet, including uh, a large uh, set of collaborators at Compute Canada. Um, and they have a software stack that the the uh, the Atlas group, for example, maintains. They know exactly what they want all the way from the operating system right on up. They like to be able to run on virtual machines and manage all their own stuff. And so they're doing a whole lot of uh, physics, uh, particle physics calculations on Arbutus um, on the virtual machines. Other things that are happening there are uh, things like uh, research portals. For example, there is a, uh, a group um, here at Dalhousie that uh, is involved in a collaboration for uh, medieval music manuscripts. And they are using um, a small virtual machine on Arbutus to, uh, to run a web server for these uh, medieval music manuscripts. So there's quite a stretch between particle physics back to, to uh, medieval musicology, um, many things in between. Um, Cedar and Graham are two general purpose high performance computing clusters. Uh, because they are pretty much the direct replacements for the four clusters that, that ACENET has been running for all this time. Um, and so they are going to be the principal thing I'm going to talk about today. Uh, when I say general purpose HPC clusters, that means they can handle everything from single core jobs, serial jobs, all the way up to 1,000 core jobs. And 1,000 cores is not a hard limit, that's just the approximate maximum size which they were designed for. They can't handle larger. They just, it gets a little bit inefficient up there. The cluster that is supposed to handle the really large jobs, a thousand cores and larger, is Niagara, the one that's uh, still in procurement right now. Um, and again, it's not a direct replacement for ACENET clusters since uh, it's been very difficult from, from day one to run a thousand core job on an ACENET cluster. Um, we have done it once or twice, but we really don't make a practice of it. So uh, yeah, the principal topic for the rest of uh, this uh, session is uh, Cedar and Graham. And um, if you're already used to running HPC on ACENET clusters, uh, what's going to look different when you go and log in at Cedar and Graham? First thing, of course, is how do you log in? Good news is if you have an ACENET account, you can already do it because if you have an ACENET account, then that means you have a Compute Canada account. You may recall when you got your ACENET account that we made you uh, go to uh, ccdb.computecanada.ca and, and get an account there, and then you had to press a button saying, please give me an ACENET login. Um, you don't need to press that button this time. Um, the, uh, all you need is your username, which is probably the same as your ACENET username. Um, I'll talk about that probably in a moment. Uh, and you need the SSH, the SSH command for the thing. Uh, it's cedar.compucanada.ca, graham.compucanada.ca. Um, and your password is going to be the same password as you used to log in at ccdb.compucanada.ca. So it's not going to be your ACENET password. It's going to be your CCDB password unless those happen to be the same, in which case, please go change them. We don't really want you reusing passwords like that. Um, and what about this case uh, where your username might not be the same as ACENET? Uh, there are a very few old accounts for which uh, 
that, that predated uh, the creation of Compute Canada and the CCDB. And uh, so in those cases, um, there might possibly be a different uh, username for ACENET and for you. Um, if there is any question about what username you should be using to log in to Cedar and Graham, you uh, can look at the uh, the My Account page, uh, the Account Details page at uh, ccdb.compute.canada.ca. Um, whatever password you use to log in is the one you're going to need, and your username is shown here in the corner. So that's what you need. What's, uh, what sort of hardware is there? There's always somebody who really enjoys knowing what the, the latest and greatest hardware looks like. So this is, a, this is merely a one slide summary. I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, first of all, both these clusters are quite large. Uh, they're uh, around 1,000 nodes each. They're around roughly 30,000 CPU cores each. Each of the nodes in them is 32 cores, with a minor exception I won't get into. Um, both both these things have uh, 32 cores per node on most of their nodes. Um, so differences from ACENET. Uh, first of all, they're bigger. The largest cluster that ACENET has uh, has ever run uh, has been Placentia, which has been 300 some odd nodes and about 4,000 cores. So uh, eight to ten times the uh, the largest ACENET cluster in terms of number of cores. And since they're more modern cores, they're somewhat more capable as well. This is the latest, uh, almost the latest Intel hardware we're running here. Um, uh, a difference from ACENET is that both these clusters have got a considerable number of GPUs, uh, graphics, graphical processing units, or I suppose we might call them general purpose graphical processing units, GP GPUs. Um, it's the sort of th these are the sort of NVIDIA cards that, uh, that hardcore computer gamers put in their machines, but we're not using them for hardcore computer gaming. Um, we're using them to do uh, calculations in things like molecular dynamics or uh, deep learning, uh, machine learning, AI. Um, GPU computing uh, has uh, turned out to be uh, highly efficient, both in terms of money and power for a certain uh, well-defined subset of, of research problems, things like molecular dynamics and deep learning. And so we, uh, Compute Canada, invested in a number of these devices for each of these uh, HPC clusters. Um, the, uh, Let's see, uh, I mentioned 32 cores per node. The largest nodes on uh, any general ACENET uh, cluster are uh, 16 cores, so the nodes are twice the size of our largest nodes. Um, the interconnect between nodes, if you are the sort of person who runs um, distributed uh, parallel computing using something like MPI, um, then uh, you will be comforted to know that the, uh, there's high-speed interconnect between all the nodes in these clusters. Uh, it's uh, pretty much latest generation InfiniBand at Graham. And at Cedar, it's a new offering from Intel called OmniPath that is effectively equivalent to, uh, to EDR InfiniBand. Somebody did some benchmarks a few weeks ago, and the, the Intel OmniPath is, is a shade faster, like 10 to... to 25% faster, I think, than the InfiniBand on the particular tests that they did. But really, from 20 feet back, they're, they're pretty much equivalent. They're both uh, approximately 100 gigabyte per second bandwidth, and they're both in the uh, range of a microsecond uh, latency. Uh, if these sorts of details excite you, I can direct you to docs.computecanada.ca where there are pages describing in, in more detail both the Cedar and the Graham hardware, and when the new Niagara comes online, there'll be a page describing that as well. So uh, you can get lots of details from our docs. So if you're used to working on ACENET systems, then you're probably accustomed to um, a home directory and depending on how old you are, uh, possibly a global scratch directory, although that's been gone for a couple of years now, um, and uh, no quota scratch. Um, those 
divisions are can be wiped from your mind um, when the ASNet clusters retire. On Cedar and Graham, the uh, file systems are going to look like this. There's going to be a home, very, pretty much the same concept, um, slightly smaller quota, in fact, 50 gigabytes per user. Um, and that is where your own personal data that applies only to you um, is expected to live, uh, program sources and executables, sure. Uh, optimized for small files and long-lived data. It'll be, it's, it's automatically backed up and there, you can retrieve things if, uh, if, you, uh, if you run into some sort of error, uh, although it's best just to not make such file deletion errors. Um, the major space, however, is going to be slash project. Um, in slash project, the quotas are enforced per group. So your entire research group, as soon as you log in, has access to one terabyte of space in project. Um, if that's not enough, you just need to send us an email and we can raise that to 10 terabytes. Um, if you are going to need more than 10 terabytes for your long-lived data, your large data sets, or your data that your group's sharing or code that your group's sharing. It doesn't need to be purely data, but it's sort of intended for data. If you're going to need more than 10 terabytes for your group for this purpose, then um, what you should do is you should get your, uh, your group leader, your professor, your principal investigator to apply in the resource allocation competition that uh, is coming up again over the next few months for Compute Canada. We hold this once a year. Um, the paperwork is all due in uh, late in the year, in November, this will be published in the next couple of weeks. Uh, everyone will get an email. All the PIs will get an email. Um, and uh, the new uh, quotas are set um, early in 2018, sometime around uh, beginning of second quarter 2018, I believe. The schedule and all the details about how to apply to the resource allocation competition will come out in an email in the next couple of weeks. So slash project then is um, basically where uh, we expect uh, great quantities of, of data to live. I'll point out that the quotas are enforced per group, so you're sharing this space with your, with your group mates. Um, and then the third file system is Scratch, um, and the quotas there are quite huge per user, 20 terabytes. But this is supposed to be, as its name says, Scratch. It's for temporary data. Um, it's not backed up. It will be purged as necessary. Uh, I believe there is not currently a, an automatic file erasure program running there, but we may introduce one um, in the next few weeks or months as we see fit, and details will be published at docs.qpcanada.ca <coughs> if and when that happens. Um, <coughs> Scratch is, uh, as it says here, intended for, for uh, large temporary data. If you're going to be doing, for example, a parallel I.O. where you have a bunch of processes writing to a single file using something like MPI I.O., you should be doing that in Scratch. Um, if you want to know how you stand with regard to these various quotas in Scratch, Project, and Home, and you may belong to more than one project potentially in Project, uh, then you can run disk usage report. Uh, I believe the command quota will also do the same thing now. As I'm going to be saying a lot today, you can find details about all of these things by going to docs.pucanada.ca. Look for storage and file management for more details. So that's the place you want to put your data. How do you get it there? Um, if you have a lot of data to move, uh, we have found that really the best tool for doing this is a tool called Globus, and there is a page at Docs about Globus. Um, it's, uh, it's a web interface. Uh, it basically, the way it works is you can get two screens, uh, or a split screen on one side is, say, the uh, glues cap where your files already exist, and the other side is Cedar where you want to move them to. Um, and you just select a bunch on the glues cap side and click the transfer arrow and Globus goes away and deals with it. If it takes minutes or hours or days, <coughs> Globus looks after it. It'll send you an email when it's finished. Um, if the connection drops, it, you don't need to restart. Globus looks after that. It's very efficient. It's very easy to use. Um, 
as I speak, there is only an endpoint at Gloose Cap in ACENET for that. Uh, there are not yet endpoints at Fundy, uh, Mahone, or Placentia, but we are expecting to fix that uh, in the next week. <coughs> Um, if uh, you have only got a few tens of gigabytes of files and you don't really want to learn a new tool, Globus, um, then you are allowed to use the other standard file transfer tools like SCP, SFTP, and RSync. Um, if you got more than 100 gigabytes, I strongly recommend you learn Globus and wait for us to get the uh, Globus endpoint set up at your site. Uh, so that's where the data should go, and that's how you should move it. Um, a little more about what things are, whoops, what things are going to look like um, when you get to, uh, to your directories, uh, Graham or Cedar. Um, in, uh, in your home directory, so I'm going to use myself as an example. My username is rdixon, so my home directory is called slash home slash rdixon. Inside slash rdixon, there is a subdirectory called scratch, except it's not actually a subdirectory. It is a symbolic link. Um, I hope you, I expect many of you probably know what a symbolic link is, but in case there's uh, some people listening who don't, maybe you have heard of Windows shortcuts. A Windows shortcut is the same thing as what we call a symbolic link in, uh, in Linux. That is to say, um, uh, on your personal computer, your laptop, well, laptops rarely have two drives nowadays. Uh, on your personal desk side computer, um, you may perhaps have a C hard drive and a D hard drive. Um, your C hard drive can fill up and your D hard drive will still, may still have space. Uh, the two hard drives are uh, analogous to the file system, as I was mentioning back here. Um, uh, slash home, slash project, slash scratch. They all have different quotas, which is to say they have different amounts of space, and one of them can fill up while the other two still have space. Um, but in your home directory, you have what looks like a directory, a subdirectory called scratch, except it's not actually a subdirectory. It is a symbolic link, or a shortcut, if you like, to the Scratch file system. And in the Scratch file system, you've got uh, the Scratch quota, which was huge, 20 terabytes, I think it was. You have another subdirectory called Project, which is a symbolic link or shortcut to a directory with a random number <laughs> as the name in the Project file system. And so files that are uh, created in the Project subdirectory, which is actually slash project slash some random number, files created in there should fall, will fall under the quota for the project file system, which was by default one terabyte for your group, as you recall. There is a third subdirectory inside your home directory, well, pardon me, a third symbolic link, rather, called projects, plural. Um, it is possible for that you may belong to more than one project. Um, your supervisor may have made a resource allocation, uh, gone through the resource allocation competition uh, in previous year and has a separate project for which they're allocated more than the usual amount of space or more than the usual amount of computer CPU time. Um, or it's possible you may have two different bosses. Uh, it does happen to some people, sorry. Um, so it's possible in projects you may find more than one subdirectory in there. And each of those is its own symbolic link into different places in the project file system. You'll notice that for me, um, Homer Dixon project points to 600790, and project def R. Dixon points to project 600790, the same thing. But def R. Dixon AC points to a different space, and those will have uh, different quotas, but they will still be in slash project. So if you have access to different uh, groups, um, then you may have uh, separate quotas inside projects. And again, the utility disk usage report may be of some help here. It will show you what groups you've got and what quotas you've got on the different file systems. So uh, available software then. 
Um, at ACENET, we have been in the habit for many years of saying that uh, if there's some piece of software you want to use, um, ask us. If it's easier for us to install it than for you to install it for yourself, we'll do it for you. If it's easier for you to install it for yourself, we'll show you how to do it. Uh, the same rule applies uh, at Compute Can on these Compute Canada resources. So to this extent, it's a lot like continuing on with ACENET, uh, except that it's a whole new list of software on the new machines. The list of software that's on the new machines is available at docs.computecanada.ca wiki available software. And the list is getting longer almost daily. There's, um, I haven't counted it, but I think there's well over a hundred different uh, packages installed there now. Um, not everything that exists on ACENET uh, can currently be found on Compute Canada. Um, we're going to try and make sure that there are no serious gaps there. Uh, but I'll make some comments about some of the, uh, some of the unique cases that exist at ACENET. Um, with our computational chemists, uh, a package called Gaussian is exceedingly popular. Gaussian is governed by a license that means we have to get uh, record agreement from everyone who uses Gaussian saying that yes, they acknowledge, understand, and agree to the terms of the Gaussian license. That's all we just need to have on file that yes, you read this and agree to it. Same thing is true uh, on Cedar and Graham, except that you must re-register. We can't just take your ACENET approval over. You need to file a new one by writing to support at computecanada.ca and saying, I wish to use Gaussian. I've read the terms uh, off the, the website. Go find the website page about Gaussian, uh, the docs.computecanada page about Gaussian. Read the terms. Send the email to support at computecanada.ca. It's that easy. Um, there is no, uh, this is also, this also pertains to our Compute Canada uh, colleagues. There is no WebMO uh, available. So there's no nice graphical interface via the web uh, for Gaussian. You can, uh, you can use uh, graphical tools on your personal computers, set up your uh, molecules that way and move the files over. Um, MATLAB is another interesting case. Mat MathWorks offers three slightly different models for how to use MATLAB on a high performance computing cluster. Um, the model that we have used at ACENET is not going, is the one of the three that's not going to be available uh, at, uh, at Cedar and Graham. Um, the two models that are available there are you can compile MATLAB using MCR. Um, you can compile MATLAB code on your local Linux machine um, and then move the executables to Compute Canada and run them there on the massive numbers of CPUs that are available there. Um, or you can use the bring your own license model to run MATLAB on uh, Cedar or Graham. Um, we have assurances from MathWorks that the academic licenses that cover most, uh, most university researchers in Canada if, you're, if you can use MATLAB at your university via your university license, then uh, MathWorks has assured us that we can, uh, in effect, uh, use that license to allow you to run on Cedar or Graham. Uh, I personally have not walked through the process of making this work yet, uh, but I know people who have, so if you uh, want to try that out, um, again, write to support at computecanada.ca and uh, we'll, uh, we'll make it work for you. Um, the, uh, there is a, a general guideline, I guess not so much a rule as a guideline, that Compute Canada um, does not want to get into the business of buying software licenses. They've made an exception for uh, compilers. They've paid for a license for the Intel compilers because those are uh, exceedingly useful running Intel hardware. Uh, the GNU compilers are great, but the Intel can do some things they can't. Um, so they've paid for an Intel compiler license and uh, the, uh, via uh, one of the uh, regional consortia, SharkNet, um, we are also providing the Gaussian license at no cost to our users as well. Um, beyond those two exceptions, do not expect Compute Canada to uh, say yes to anything that involves Compute Canada spending money on a software license. 
Um, if you want to run some piece of software that involves a paid license, then we need to try and execute the bring your own license model that I just described from MATLAB. Um, your university, your research group, um, a bunch of you know, some national organization that all collaborates in using this particular piece of software um, can get together and purchase a license and we can figure out how to make that operate on national equipment, Cedar, Graham, Niagara. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that'll have to be dealt with case by case because every piece of commercial software has got slightly different, has got a different fee schedule and slightly different license terms. Um, we'll make it work, but uh, it may involve uh, several weeks of back and forth with the vendor to make these things work. So don't expect uh, service tomorrow if there's, uh, if there's a commercial license involved in some piece of software. But ask us anyway and we'll figure it out. So that's uh, about software and its installation. Um, if, you, uh, if you've been working at ASNet for a while, uh, you've probably read some instruction somewhere that says uh, just type module load some package or perhaps uh, there's that line is, is in your standard job script template, module load something or other. Um, that will still work much the same on Cedar and Graham. Uh, however, the underlying implementation has changed and there will occasionally be some changes in the behavior that may possibly come up. Um, the first and most, uh, the one that I most often run into is that module avail will show you what modules are available to you, but if you've already done something like module load Intel, it will not show you any modules that conflict with Intel. It'll only show you the modules that you can load that are uh, that uh, are consistent with the modules you've already got loaded. If you want to know what everything that available that's available is, then you need to use module spider to see everything and it'll give you the big list of everything um, as well as some comments on what you need to do to load the one you're interested in. You can also say module spider uh, name of a package and it'll tell you something about what uh, what's in conflict with that package and why module avail wouldn't show it to you for example. Uh, if you don't actually know the name of the package you can try module keyword uh, keyword um, module keyword chemistry for example and see whether that brings you anything. Um, uh, if that doesn't help then you probably want to go back to the uh, the, the docs page with the list of available software and see if you can find it there. Um, and the command module load uh, may potentially change other loaded other modules that you've got loaded. This is new behavior. The existing one at ASNet would just carp that no, it can't load that because it's in conflict with something you've already got. Um, the LMOD uh, on Cedar and Graham will try and do the right thing. And 19 times out of 20, it'll work just fine and you don't actually need to worry about this stuff. But uh, for that one time in 20. Um, it's, uh, here's your slight bit of warning. Uh, module load may change loaded modules. Module avail might not tell you everything. Module spider is probably what you want. Other than that, it's going to look a lot like the old module system on ASNet and other Compute Canada clusters as well. Um, oh, a little, uh, little side note here. You'll notice that the documentation page for this at the bottom of this uh, slide uh, actually has a French title. Utiliser de module slash en for English. Um, it's a national organization. It's bilingual. <coughs> We're trying to provide uh, all these documentation pages both in English and French. Um, most of them are being authored in English and then translated into French. This one happens to have gone the other way around. It was authored in French and has been translated into English. And so it has a French title with a slash en at the end. The really big change that um, oops, that you're going to have to deal with going from ASNet to uh, to Cedar or Graham, um, well, possibly that project uh, symbolic link and, and 
the project file system might be might be the biggest change, but it, it's uh, tied for top tied for the top two with the job scheduler. The job scheduler on Cedar and Graham is called Slurm, which uh, unfortunately I'm told is the name of some uh, alcoholic drink in the Futurama cartoon series, but I don't watch it, so that's all I know. Um, it's got the name has got nothing to do with that. I believe the name stands for Simple Linux Utility for Resource Management. Um, it's not all that simple anymore, uh, but uh, it is basically the same concepts as uh, existed with the ASNIT scheduler SGE. Um, it's just new syntax, new syntax, and uh, some new capabilities. Uh, so new syntax, for example, instead of uh, a job script, a job script for SGE would say something like hash dollar sign dash l h underscore rt. Uh, that's a hard limit on runtime equals one hour, zero minutes, zero seconds. With Slurm, it's going to be hash s batch dash dash time equals one hour, zero minutes, zero seconds. You still need to supply a time limit, as you always did at ASNET. That's still a requirement. Um, but uh, how you request the individual resources, like time and memory and number of CPUs and, and so on and so forth, um, all those have changed a little bit. Um, the jobs, the <laughs> sorry, the command to submit jobs is no longer QSub; it's now S batch. Um, the command to check on the status of your jobs is not QSTAT; it's now SQ. Except if you type SQ without any uh, argument, it'll show you everybody's jobs in the system, which you probably don't want to see. So you can type SQ U and your username, and it'll just tell you about yours. Um, Timeline is still required, like I said, and possibly an explicit account. Um, so remember back when I was telling you about the project file system, and it is possible that you may be associated with more than one project, like I had defr Dixon and defr Dixon dash ac. Um, if you're associated with more than one project, then you also need to tell Slurm which of these projects should this job be accounted to. Now this all goes back into uh, basically how, what we have to report to our funding agencies like CFI and, and and, and CERC and the provinces and so on and so forth. Um, they, we, we need to be able to tell them uh, with good truth and intention that, uh, okay, this many CPU hours and this many terabytes of storage were consumed um, by biomedical uh, research and this many CPU hours and this many terabytes of storage were consumed by uh, physics research and this many by chemistry and this many by engineering and so on and so on. Um, and we need to break it down a little bit finer as well. Uh, so uh, if you've got two bosses or if your boss is associated with more than one project because he's put in different uh, rack applications, um, then it may be necessary for you to uh, tell Slurm which of these various accounts, which have got the same name as those project subdirectories, which of these various accounts um, should, you, should we charge this job to. This stuff is all documented again at docs.pcanada.ca, um, and uh, if you want to have a sort of a neat one-page table of how things have changed, like from HRT to time, you can look at this Rosetta Stone page from the from skedmd.com, who is the company that uh, manages uh, 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 maintenance on Slurm. But I'll also show you an example script here, just to make some of this explicit. So this is what a, uh, a Slurm job script is going to look like. The hash dollar sign bin bash line at the front of the script has always got to be there with Slurm. It's going to carp at you if that's not there, but that's just the same as every shell script that uh, we've probably exposed you to over the years. Um, there are a bunch of directives, uh, such as dash dash time equals zero days, dash, zero hours, colon, five minutes. Uh, if you don't put any punctuation in here at all, that's going to be minutes. Um, so you could just put in time equals five, and that's five minutes. If you want five hours, you've got to put in five, colon, zero, or whatever, five times 60 is 300, I guess. 
The next line says n tasks equals four. You've probably guessed what that means. That means four tasks for parallel execution. If you're running MPI, for example, uh, like this example does, then that just means we're going to start four MPI processes. Um, we're going to ask for uh, 1,024 megabytes of memory per process, which isn't a lot. That's a gigabyte of memory of RAM uh, for each of those four processes. So in total, that'll be four gigabytes of RAM, one gigabyte times four. And here's where you specify the account. I'm associated with two accounts, so I need to actually put in this line saying dash dash account equals one of those two names, the same thing that showed up in my uh, projects subdirectory. And then run your program, in this case an MPI program. Um, if you are uh, the sort of person who's used MPI run before, we would like you to change that to S run, which is tightly integrated with Slurm. The S stands for Slurm here. S run instead of MPI run does the same thing. It gives us slightly better accounting records um, and it may do other things under the hood that I haven't quite figured out yet. Um, but uh, if you submit the job and you've got MPI run instead of S run, it will probably still work. It just uh, the accounting records will be missing a couple minor details. Um, again, all of this is laid out uh, in the docs under the running jobs page and uh, the Rosetta Stone. Um, I will mention here, because I've got time, that uh, if you are running big jobs, uh, now this, this only affects you if you are running MPI or similar distributed parallel computing that uses a lot of cores, like more than 32 cores. If you're running MPI jobs that use more than 32 cores, 60 cores, 100 cores, 200 cores, something like that, then you probably should be not using n tasks as shown in this example. Go read about it on the wiki, but you should be asking for complete nodes. And recall that the nodes in these machines are 32 cores. So if you can run your distributed computing efficiently on 32 or 64 or 96 cores or some multiple of 32, then instead of asking for n tasks equals four, you should be asking for n nodes equals one, two, three, four, whatever number of nodes you need. Um, and then uh, uh, tasks per node equals 32. Or if you want to do uh, shared memory computing and you want an entire node for yourself, you want all 32 cores, you're not doing MPI, but you want all 32 uh, cores in a node and all the memory in a node, then again you should ask for, n, ask for n nodes equals one and ask for all the memory and all the cores on the node with other commands. This is laid out um, on the wiki how to do this, uh, but it is more efficient for the scheduler to give you a whole node if you can use one properly um, than to take, uh, like if you put in a request for n tasks equals 128. Um, you would find that job would be very slow to schedule. But if you asked for n nodes equals four and n tasks per node equals 32, which is the same size, it will schedule more efficiently. Okay. Right. I mentioned the account um, uh, directive here and how that fits in. I'm just going to show you what looks like what it looks like if you actually need it and you don't know it. If you type sbatch and the name of your job script to submit it, remember that sbatch is what's replacing qsub, right? So if you type sbatch to submit a batch job and it says error, you are associated with multiple CPU allocations, please specify one of the following. It will give you a list of the Valid accounts, so there's def r dixon hc and def r dixon, and there's another one in there that didn't show up in one of my project subdirectories. Um, it'll tell you exactly what the valid choices are, and you just have to go back and stick dash dash account equals one of these things into your job script and type s batch again, and it'll work fine. If you're not sure which one to choose, talk to your, your professor, your PI. If you are the PI and don't know which one to choose, um, then, uh, then write us, uh, support at acenet.ca or support at computecanada.ca, either one will work. Um, and ask us how you figure out which one of these things is appropriate, how much, which one has 
how many CPU hours or years allocated to it, um, and we'll uh, we'll straighten you out there. Um, one of the new things uh, that, uh, well, I shouldn't say new thing. We have had some GP GPUs at ASNet for years. Uh, there's been four machines attached to Mahone that have had them. Very few people have been aware of them. Uh, it's only a very small resource. Um, and so I don't think they've gotten a lot of use. As a matter of fact, I can't honestly say whether they are powered up uh, today or not. Uh, they have been powered down sometimes recently because uh, the hardware is quite old. Um, but uh, as I pointed out, uh, Cedar and Graham have got a uh, generous number, several hundred uh, NVIDIA Tesla P100 cards attached to them. Um, and if you are in uh, molecular dynamics or uh, machine learning or some other discipline, uh, there, there are others, I know that's only two, some other discipline where um, GP, GPU computing is the new big thing, or even the old big thing, um, then you might want to know how to get at them. Um, so I stuck this slide in. Uh, again, the account thing, the time thing, always got to be there. To get at a GPU, you need the GRES parameter, which stands for generic resource equals GPU, and you want one GPU um, and associated memory. So that's 32 gigabytes of memory. And then run your... GPU code um, that does the thing. Um, this GRES equals GPU colon one uh, is not going to be precisely the same for every circumstance. You're going to need to learn how to play with that a little bit. Um, and what makes this a little bit complicated is that there are three different types of nodes carrying GPUs. Um, two different nodes at Cedar and one at Graham, which is different from both the Cedar types. Um, go read about it on the docs wiki. Um, it's all laid out there, how you ask for uh, what you need, um, how you ask for a whole node, how you ask for part of a node, um, and that sort of thing. And if you read those document, those, that documentation, by the way, and you still can't figure it out, then write us. We'll improve the documentation um, as well as uh, solve your particular problem for you. Uh, okay. Uh, one, yeah, okay, this is one extra slide on the same topic. Um, one of the two uh, node types at Cedar is called a large memory GPU node. Um, those ones, um, I think that memory number is wrong. I've got to fix this slide. Uh, for those ones, you actually need an extra uh, little piece of information, GRES equals GPU colon LGPU for large GPU. And there are four of them in these large GPU nodes. and they're reserved so that you request the whole node to get at them. Um, these particular large GPU nodes were, I believe, purchased because they lined up nicely with some hardware specifications that um, our users doing deep learning um, were interested in. So these are actually pretty hot properties. I think they're, uh, they're occupied most of the time with people trying to run things like TensorFlow and, and that kind of thing. Uh, there, uh, not quite 50 minutes of me talking. What else do you want to know? 